Hello and welcome to lecture 21. Today is a special encore presentation because unfortunately the recording didn't work out, but let's get to it. So these last few lectures, we've been you know wrapping up the various uh, remaining topics in this course. And so if you remember on Monday's lecture, we talked about just general skills you might need for project development working with open source. Today we're gonna wrap up another detail and that is uh, kind of broadening our horizon to where we can bring our automation and tools uh, into our work, right? So, so far we've been building hardware generators and we've been, you know, using programming and, you know, software and automation to make really powerful hardware constructions. Uh, today we're going to try and uh, take that a step further instead of just making generators, actually talk about how to go about making or modifying the tools themselves. And so in order to do that, we're going to need an easy way to refer to the hardware. And for that, we're going to use what's called a hardware intermediate representation. We're going to cover all that today and explain that. In particular, we're talking about Fertile, which is the hardware IR for Chisel. So as I kind of just outlined, we're going to motivate the need for these hardware enemy representations, dive into Fertile, the IR for Chisel, show an example of Zion, kind of how it looks in Fertile, maybe talk about some things you might use uh, Fertile for, and then conclude kind of talking about how this is, you know, Fertile is just one of many uh, hardware IRs, and it's kind of a very exciting time right now for those in open source and hardware development for all the kind of things you can Cool things we can do with these. So let's go ahead and uh, you know load up our notebook, and this is kind of builds a lot of motivation a little more deeply, right? So think about what we've been doing all quarter. We've been you know building these hardware generators, especially you know, using Chisel. What have we been doing? Well, concretely, we've been using programming you know in Scala to uh, construct hardware designs. In particular, what we're doing is using Scala you know programming statements to call commands in the Chisel, which if you kind of squint and blur your eyes a little bit, they're all basically hardware instantiations, right? So, you know, if you define a register or if you declare an instantiator module, that makes sense. But also interestingly, if you do something like you connect, you know, uh, a wire to another uh, value, you can kind of think of that as instantiating a connection, right? So once again, really what we're doing is you known as with Chisel, you know, we're constructing hardware by just instantiating all these hard pieces and we're using the Scala around it, you know, to uh, orchestrate which things connect to what, which things are instantiating, right? And so uh, what's been fun about these hardware generators allows us to kind of automate this process, right? So rather than just simply always statically assigning the essentially the same components, connecting them to the same things in the same way, we can have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit of parameterization. We can, you know, put in parameters to control certain things and we can arbitrate and instantiate arch numbers of things, connect them accordingly. Um, so when you're building these generators, you know, especially as you've got an experience with your homework assignments, you really kind of need to um, imagine all the possible situations you want to support, provide those parameters to your generator, and of course also, you know, actually implement those uh, support for those parameters inside the generator, right? And so uh, as you're going through this process, right, although from the outside, these generators seem pretty awesome where you kind of, you know, just give them parameters and do the right thing, uh, you know, as you've learned, writing them is not trivial. <laughs> Uh, especially, uh, you know, you takes a bit of a while to get it working right. You want to really fine tune it. You want to make sure it works in all the corner cases for all the parameters. But even still, if you kind of keep optimizing and improving it, you're putting a lot of development effort into that generator, right? And uh, the generator can get really sophisticated, can do really cool capabilities and really cool things. But all that kind of expertise and effort is locked into that generator. And in some cases, that's that's great, right? I mean. The goal is to, you know, build a really capable generator and that's what you've done. Uh, but you know, if you're thinking about, you know, kind of amortizing uh, your team's effort over a larger project with many sub projects, you know, maybe there's a way you'd wish to kind of have some of that effort be more portable uh, and more reusable, right? Because you can imagine some of the things you're doing, especially when it comes to things like optimization, maybe it's not quite so specific to your design. Maybe it's kind of a more general pattern and you wish, well, hmm, is there some way you could try to reuse that, right? Because Otherwise, all, kind of, all that code and all the expertise and the efforts kind of just like locked into that generator. So imagine you wanted to try and do that. Imagine you wanted to try to make uh, the optimization somehow more portable between generators, right? So you have this optimization, you know, and for sake of argument, you said, this is great. I really spent a lot of effort doing this cool hardware transformation. I want to use optimization on other generators. Um, so what would you do? Well, what I've taught you so far in this course, you might try to encapsulates optimization in some clever Scala, right? So, you know, you could use all the features we learned about. You could use generic types, inheritance, functional programming, all the good stuff, you know, using higher order functions and that sort of stuff and try to, you know, have the appropriate amount of templating and such, you know, you kind of somehow boil that um, optimization down to some sort of, you know, pattern that people can kind of recognize. 
and then they kind of you know fill in the parts the you know template portions of that pattern to you know match their case and then your you know spiffy scala does the rest right and uh you know you can imagine this being possible but not easy right uh anytime somebody wants to apply this optimization to their generator they're gonna need to you know somehow make sure they're properly instantiating your optimization and you know filling in all the right fields and it matches right and you as a person trying to make this reusable optimization are you know forced to figure out a way to um kind of design a pattern that's you know sufficiently flexible to kind of support everyone and this is tricky right but you can imagine in some cases this is very believable this is something you definitely could do um and so after you've gone through this you know significant effort uh one of your users says that's great and then you know you look in their uh you know look go look in your github issues and you see there's a new issue put some user this is fantastic um we wish we could do this optimization with this other optimization. Now, obviously, you need to kind of, you know, figure out, wait, how to make this crazy optimization I just figured out compatible with another optimization or how to make it composable with another optimization, right? And oof, that's, you know, pull your hair out kind of hard, right? Because you already had to do all the gymnastics to kind of figure out a way how to, like, meta program with optimization and make it a way where it can kind of be packaged and reused. And now you want to figure out how to do that with other optimizations, right? And oof, that, that that's, that, I'm, you know, I'm shivering over here because that, that sounds hard. Right, so what, why is that hard, right? Well, the input interface, you're, you're defining this, right? You're kind of defining this, uh, how you're, what goes into optimization, but basically it's really broad, right? You're basically trying to make some sort of pattern template kind of thing that can handle mostly arbitrary scala, not technically anything, right? But a lot of it, right? And so, oh my gosh, you know, entire arbitrary programming language is somehow you kind of want to inject uh, your stuff and interact and mix in stuff in other people's generator. And this is hard, right? So, hmm. Question is, is there some better way to maybe make some sort of uh, optimization or transformation uh, more portable, more reusable? Um, and so let's figure out an alternative way, right? So this, this prior approach of trying to make some sort of super flexible templated thing, oof, that that's that's hard. So instead of trying to you know have her intervention, have her impact at the time of constructing design in the generator, what if instead we construct a design, and then given an existing design go in and optimize it, right? So that's kind of the alternative approach, right? So rather than trying to do everything all at once, rather than trying to construct a design the first time, you know, which includes handling all the parameters for all the things the users requested, and then on top of that, you know, mixing in all these optimizations um, and doing that in a way that's generic and reusable, rather than trying to do it all at once, what if instead let the generator developer focus on constructing the module to make sense for that use case. And then once there's a design that exists, let's go in and optimize it, right? So you can now see that this is um, a much more scalable, trackable way about dealing with things, right? Because now the uh, you know interface to our um, optimization is no longer you know some sort of complicated thing where it kind of nests itself in Scala in some weird way. No, now our input to our thing is a hardware design. We somehow modify the hardware design, and then our output is also a hardware design. So right, so our input and output format is now the same, right? So this makes composability and compatibility between our optimizations much more trivial, right? Because, you know, if I, uh, even if I change the design, as long as it still kind of conforms to what we call a hardware design, whatever, you know, data type that might be, um, you can see how these can kind of be plugged together. You have optimization A, takes hardware design in, now it's design optimized by optimization A. Then you pass on to optimization B, and here's the design, and it spits it out, now it's design optimized by optimization C, B, A, and B, right? So you can see how it's much more scalable. So we've kind of pushed that development effort around, right? Where before we we're doing as much as we could in a generator. Now we're saying, you know what, let's sometimes there's things that's maybe hard to do in a generator. So instead of do it downstream in the tools, once the design's already instantiated, we're gonna go ahead and modify it and improve the design, right? And what's cool is by putting in the tools, it also makes it easy to kind of make it port more portable, right? Cause now it's no longer in the generator. Now it's inside the tools and now other designs produced by other generators can use that same uh, tool to get that optimization, right? So big picture here is they're kind of blurring the line between you know where we're putting our automation and our smarts on parameterization, right? Is it not just in the generator, but actually now into the tools? Okay, so let's kind of um, appreciate how this kind of looks in terms of uh, where it goes and what we can get. So this is a complexity difficulty curve. You may have seen these in other courses, right? So next axis, we're looking at how hard it is, or sorry, how hard we want, to, how complicated things we want to do. And the wax looking at how hard it is actually to do this, right? So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, 
uh, more complex things usually are harder to do, right? Ideally, you know, you'd have a flat line along the x-axis and yeah, that would be that, right? It'd be really easy always, right? But no, no, usually more complicated things are harder. So ideally you want some sort of linear slope, hopefully a low linear slope like that. Um, these diagrams are used to capture some things where sometimes it's not a total linear slope. Maybe there's something where it's like, you know, you access a certain level of ability and you can do a lot of things and then to do anything more, there's this huge cliff you need to get over, right? Um, and so often these diagrams are using things like uh, even games or even like you know, operating system and interface kind of develop it. But in our case, as someone who's trying to, uh, you know, build a hardware design, we can kind of think of it how it kind of captures the difficulty of making a certain design in a certain way. So if you go off and write a single static design, even in a language like Verilog, getting started isn't too hard, right? If anything, it's maybe almost as easy, if not even easier than the chisel designs we're doing without parameterization, right? But, you know, very quickly, a very static language, a very static design is going to get really hard to do certain parameterizations and certain optimizations, right? So it's going to ramp up pretty fast. And at some point, it's just like really hard, right? At that point, basically, um, you're going to need to, you know, do tons and tons of work and it's just, you know, lots of work. Uh, with a generator, right, maybe it's a little more work to get a generator started, but generators allow you to do a certain amount of transformations kind of in the generator, right? Uh, let's for now momentarily not worry about reusing gener or optimization across generators, but even just in general, you can do some pretty cool stuff. But at some point, you know, something gets officially complicated, like we were just describing, and even the generator is going to get pretty difficult to do things with. And, you know, arguably, you know, maybe a generator, even in those worst cases, is perhaps more easy to deal with than trying to have a, you know, uh, overly complex static design. Now, this custom transformations we're talking about, adding some kind of, you know, secret sauce to our tool flow that actually works on design that already exists, arguably it's allow us to have a much more gradual increase in difficulty, right? Where, you know, when it starts to get really unmanageable for the generator, perhaps then we should use this custom transformation. Uh, and it's not easy, it's not trivial, but we can do some really amazing, sophisticated things with that. And we'll be much more scalable to do that. Cool. So, um, the question is, well, how are we going to do that? In order to do that, we're going to need a way to describe the hardware we're working with. And for that, we're going to use a intermediate representation or IR for short. So an IR is, it's going to describe on a well-defined syntax, all the parts of our hardware. So every little feature about it, every type of operation, every thing, every attribute and metadata about them, all going to be captured in this very well-specified syntax. Um, so if you're sitting here thinking, wait a second, doesn't that kind of sound like, I don't know, like the language or what we already kind of, you know, we're writing our designs in the first place? Yes, but understand that, you know, even when you write something like in the chisel, you are sometimes describing things at a high level. There's kind of chisel inter intermixed with Scala. This IR is really kind of just boiling it down to its, you know, core essence. And in particular, it's boiling it down to you know, exactly what are the things we're connecting and what exactly are, are they. And so using an IR is a well-established practice uh, from the compiler's PL community. Um, and, you know, it's been used in all sorts of tools that kind of look like compilers. Uh, and it's only recently kind of found its way in the last, you know, 10 plus years into the hardware community in a very public way. So what's nice about having an interview representation is this allows you to really interface uh, kind of make it much more interchangeable, reusable, uh, interoperable uh, hardware tool flow or compiler kind of like tool flow in general, right? So um, with this language, it's easier for someone to describe definitively what the hardware is and then you can change it as long as it's still in that same language, it's easy to work with, right? You can imagine, you know, if you're building some sort of hardware design tool, of course, under the hood, you have data structures and data types to represent the hardware you're dealing with, but it's one thing to have those data structures and data types. Another thing to have those be, you know, strictly specified and, you know, rigid. And that way, you know, even your future versions of your tool, even version of your tool for your competitor still speaks that same language, right? They may not, right? You may have your own kind of internal uh, format. But having this externalized format that's standardized is really helpful, right? So if I want to make an optimization, it's as simple as me adding a new pass, a new transformation to the middle of the tool flow. So I need to understand how to, you know, read this IR and change it and then spit it back out. But if I can do that, I can inject my transformation in the middle of a tool flow. Uh, or well, guess what? You know, maybe I'm tired of chisel and I want a new language. Well, if I can, you know, make a front end that reads that new language and spits out this hardware IR, I can then reuse the rest of the tool flow. And I can just swap out that piece, right? Or what if I want 
uh, to target a new backend, right? Rather than having, for example, we've been targeting, you know, simulation with treadle, or maybe we've also been using uh, the barrel log output, maybe I want to put some other kind of format. Uh, I could, once again, write a backend which takes in the IR and puts something else out, and I can reuse the rest of this, right? So it makes it really easy to kind of have this interoperable common language, right? And as I said, this is something that's kind of a more recent revelation in the hardware community because this wasn't always um, the case, right? Obviously, I said these tools have some sort of IR internally, but it's one thing to have an IR internally. It's another thing to really specify, standardize it, you know, keep to that format for a while, and most importantly, externalize it, right? Make it available for other uh, people to have tools that kind of read it and spit it out, and et cetera, right? And so, uh, like I said, this, this capability of having these IRs and kind of factoring things this way is really powerful, right? So, for example, in the uh, PL community, right, there were IRs and compilers for a long time, but, you know, having something like LLVM, where it's a really standardized, really widely adopted IR was really helpful, right? Where, you know, people could do things like, hey, I want to make a new language, I want to make Rust, and they can leverage all of this amazing expertise for the rest of the compiler and get a good compiler performance, but I can instead focus on what I want to do to make Rust. Or, you know, for example, you want to make a new backend for a new ISA, like RISC-5. Writing the RISC-5 ISA backend is a tiny fraction of code compared to the rest, and you get all these great optimizations and all these compiler passes and all the languages the rest of the front end support, right? So it's a really good way to kind of architect these types of tools. And this is, a, this is the best practice from the PL community. And we're now, well, not, it's been, been brought to the hardware for like the last 10 years, right? So it's kind of been a real big kind of change here, right? So having a specified externalized hardware IR is really kind of neat. Um, so the one we've been working with and not even knowing it is one called Fertile, which stands for the Flexible Intermediate Representation for RTL. Uh, and this is the one that's used for Chisel. Um, and uh, Chisel, of course, uses Fertile under the hood. Uh, and there's tools that work with it. There actually are some other languages that uh, front ends that spit out Fertile, and there's other tools besides the ones using this course that take Fertile as in, uh, sorry, input and spit something else out. They're completely different backends. And so Fertile's really been kind of a game changer. It's kind of enabled people to make uh, tools that are able to work on this IR, as well as making the uh, Chisel tool flow itself much more robust, right? So, uh, you know, going way back, um, all the way back to Chisel, right? Remember that Chisel, if you look deeply into things we're dealing with, it's Chisel version 3.4, right? So, uh, you know, many years ago, it was a Chisel 1. Uh, I was there for that, uh, and that was back when everything was in a single SVN repository, and we didn't even separate the designs in Chisel from the tool in Chisel, because why would they? I mean, it's just a tiny little project. Um, so we got that going, and then people improved it, and they made Chisel 2, uh, and they finally, you know, ruined a lot of things, but as it kind of got more adopted and more used, Chisel 2 kind of became overly complicated, right? It was very monolithic. It had all these kind of very complicated structures. And so if somebody wanted to come in and change something about it, or if you didn't just fix a bug, it was such a steep learning curve, right? That complexity difficulty curve was just, you know, uh, you know, like that, right? It was just so steep, right? Um, Cause it was so complicated and monolithic, right? It was really kind of hard to deal with, hard to get correct. Cause you know, when you look at the codes, oh my gosh, just code I'm trying to deal with right now does like five things at once. How do I make sure it's getting all five of these little details correct? So it's hard to test, hard to understand. So as a result, you know, it's a little buggy, a little hard to get contributions. And so as part of the major rewrite uh, people took when they made Chisel 3, uh, they introduced this uh, IR, Fertile, and it really improved things dramatically, right? So by having this IR and now structuring the internals of this tool flow as these, you know, small passes that do a very small change on the IR, each optimization, each, sorry, each transformation, each pass, there's very little at times. So they're very easy to kind of uniquely develop and test individually. And then you'll have this you know, sequence of these passes that actually performs the overall operation that really made this whole tool feel much more robust. And so the result is that a relatively modest sized team for a good number of years has been developing Chisel and Fertile and it's developed into this um, really robust, uh, reliable tools, quite impressive, right? And if you look at the development effort required for doing this without this great software architecture and without using Scala, it's just astronomical, right? So it's kind of amazing how between using Scala and this good architecture, you're able to kind of make it so productive and so correct. Um, so you hear me in this lecture and perhaps in other lectures refer to fertile, sometimes a little bit ambiguous when someone says the word fertile, because it's kind of not clear what they're referring to, right? Are they referring to the specification or format, which sometimes it is. There's, you know, if you go look in this Information for Fertile, you can go find, there's like a 100-page like a PDF that specifies all the little details about the language and all the rules. There's also a design in the Fertile format, right? So, you know, this is .fir as a file. And then there is this library of Scala code, the Fertile library, which processes Fertile. And so uh, when we're actually doing our stuff in this course, we use 
actually two different collections of code, right? It's actually Chisel 3, which is kind of the front end, which is um, taking in design, producing Fertile, and then there's this Fertile library, which is doing various optimizations and transformations on the Fertile to actually do the rest of the work. Um, and so here kind of is now shown as a tool flow, right? So you can see our designs come in, use this Chisel front end to kind of process them, they make this .fir file, and then inside the Fertile library, there's all sorts of transformations, optimizations, passes, etc. Uh, but let's say, in this hypothetical example, we're targeting uh, Verilogs, so we're using the Verilog backend available in that library. It's going to automatically call the appropriate transformations before that and then produce the Verilog, right? And so really there's kind of two tools that work here. There's kind of Chisel and there's Fertile, which is inside of, you know, uh, this library. Um, okay, so I'm going to maybe go back a slide before I move on. Given uh, the situation, Let's see what we actually need to put into this hardware IR. How are we going to go about describing hardware? Well, here's a brief uh, type hierarchy, the kinds of types there are. So the kind of components you might find in Fertile, in Fertile are, you know, number one, a circuit's the entire design. It's composed of modules. These modules are much like the modules, you know, we are exactly like the modules we do from Chisel. Um, so there's some number of modules inside a circuit. Uh, and then uh, where it's interesting is these other parts, right? So a module, of course, has ports, right? You know, input and output ports, IOs, that makes sense. Um, then there's what we call statements and expressions. So a statement does a complete operation. So it produces some sort of value or instantiates some sort of thing and it, you know, completes that. Meanwhile, an expression um, is usually a portion of a statement. So maybe something like, you know, uh, referencing a certain uh, existing signal, like a reference, or it might be a literal, like, you know, this is a unsigned end of four. It might be an operation, like I want to do, add these two things together. And these arrows represent, you know, which of these uh, components can kind of contain other components. So you can see that, for example, statements can contain statements, right? So you can have something called a block statement, which contains many statements inside of it. Uh, more commonly, expressions can contain expressions, right? So you can say, hey, I want to have, you know, uh, I want to do a primitive operation, addition, for example, and then what are you operating on? Well, there's two other expressions you're pointing to, and those are, you know, the two inputs, for example. And uh, also, of course, you keep track of types, right? I want to keep track of, you know, not just, you know, is it U winter essence, but how many bits, for example. So if we uh, actually look at some example of these kind of things, so here's kind of the point, thing we just talked about, right? It says, you know, statements um, are things like, you know, connections, declarations, etc. cetera. Um, let's move on to actually see uh, a little example. So here's a uh, little bit tiny chisel module. It's a delay module. Uh, so it you know simply takes in the value and then uh, delays it by cycle using register. So uh, if we run it, uh, we can see in the Verilog, uh, you know, it's like we kind of expected, there's our, our our output is assigned to reg and reg is assigned on the pause edge of the clock. Okay, so we're pretty familiar with generating Verilog for this kind of stuff. Uh, in the same notebooks we're using all quarter actually, we could do get fertile and let's see what that looks like. So now we're looking at the fertile turned into kind of a human readable text form. And it's not super crazy, right? Uh, we can see, you know, here's the circuit, our top level. Uh, there is, you know, the module delay we're dealing with. Okay, we have our clock, a subtype clock. We have our reset. You know, these are things kind of implicitly added automatically. Uh, you know, subtype you went uh, one bit wide. Then we have our IO. You know, remember, IO is a bundle, right? So there is our input and our output. Uh, sorry, in, or in and or out. And because we declared our IO bundle by default in the output direction, to kind of flip it for the input. Okay, and then, you know, what do we instantiate? Well, we instantiate that register. You know, here we are instantiating things in hardware. We connect the um, input of the register to io.in, and then we connect the output of the register to the input of out-out, connected to the output, right? And then these things are these source locators. These are info, you know, to help us remember where you came from. They're not super helpful in the notebooks because, of course, they're referring to some sort of, you know, uh, virtual file that was used in the Ammonite to make all this, but uh, you can see that. So, okay, so here's just a peek at that fertile. Um, and instead, we actually do a little bit more work uh, kind of doing stuff. We can kind of print this out more verbosely, right? So, for example, if we want to look at, you know, how does it actually look as data structures in memory as opposed to just human readable text? Well, you can see here it is kind of splatted out. Maybe it's not super easy to read. Uh, so, maybe we'll go ahead and uh, use some of these helper functions to make it a little easier to look at. And so here, what they've done is you can kind of see how these various things are nested, right? So under the hood, right, inside the Fertile library, all these things are um, inheriting from abstract classes or even case classes. And um, 
you have all these various fields, right? So, okay, circuit, the top thing, our circuit contains some more modules, right? So how those modules contained? They're actually contained in the array buffer, right? You know, collection. So, okay, there's a module, our module's called delay, uh, and its ports are stored in uh, an array as well. And so you can see, okay, here's a port. It's a clock, it, we, we're calling it clock. It's of type, in, it's an input direction of type clock type, you know. Here's a router port, you know, a reset, which is an input direction. And it's a uint of one bit wide. Um, what about some router ports? Well, we have our io.in and io.out. So remember, io.in and io.out are, you know, actually technically references within a bundle. So first we have uh, this entire, uh, you know, io uh, bundle, right? So it's bundle type. And then inside the bundle, we're accessing fields, right? So okay, we have a field of in. It's actually in reverse direction as opposed to the default direction. This is going to be input because it's flipping it. Cool. Okay, so that's just the ports. Now to get to the meat of it, right? So we have uh, all the statements, right? So we said before, there's a special kind of statement called a block, which allows us to have multiple statements inside of it. Okay, so inside of our block, we have a collection of statements. What kind of statements do we have? Well, we define a register, and even just defining a register, we need to give it a name, um, and you know, give it what kind of clock it's working with, and it's reset signal and reset, reset value as well. And then our other two statements are connects, right? So for example, we're connecting that register to io.in, so First we uh, are referring to IO, and then we want to refer to a field within IO that's a subfield, so it's IO.in. Um, meanwhile, you know, our last statement is connected to the output, right? So we want to, once again, reference IO, subfield, no, dot out, so IO.out is connected to reg, right? So, oof, uh, here's again, you know, if you want to look at it, um, kind of in the fertile, where it's a little bit more human readable, as opposed to kind of spying all the data structures and all the fields that's actually used in Scala, but it gives you a little bit of flavor of what's going on, right? You can kind of see how this kind of fits together. And uh, if we go ahead and look at uh, that, maybe visually, and this is uh, a few artistic uh, changes made to make this a little bit more readable, this kind of all fits together, right? We have a module, it has, you know, some more ports. Those ports have types and names. Uh, and then we have statements. And, you know, for example, we're essentially in the register. Uh, and we have various connects and such. And here I'm not worrying about the bundle details. And, of course, I should also point out this example is actually from uh, one of the papers introduced, uh, Fertile. And you can go ahead and find that, that link from ICCAD. Cool, I'm gonna pause here. I don't wanna take questions right now, but of course this is an encore, so unfortunately there's no audience. All right, um, let's keep going. So, um, let's talk a little bit about how the Fertile Library kind of works with stuff, right? So, one of the neat things it does is by working with things with IR and doing these kind of very small passes is, I hear this term lowering or lowers. So what it's doing is, it's trying to get some sort of operation done and it's taking many small steps to get there. And these small steps are easy to kind of develop and test in isolation. And then we will put them all together to get the net goal. And so particularly what we want to do is we want to take something like uh, our high level chisel and uh, turn that into something low level and concrete, like something we can turn into fair log, for example. And so this process is referred to as lowering, right? Where we want to kind of take all these high level abstractions and kind of make them more concrete, turn them into more simple things, right? So sometimes when you do lowering, right, you know, you have this, simple abstract statement, and then it turns into, you know, multiple simpler statements to kind of implement that abstraction, right? And I kind of capture this process, once again, kind of in the spirit of standardizing and formalizing things, uh, Fertile has this notion of various levels of abstraction, right? So there's something we call high Fertile, which is, you know, very capable, very flexible uh, Fertile, which, you know, this is kind of like what comes out of the front, chisel front end, it's not quite, but it's very close. And there's something we call low Fertile, which is, you know, pretty close to like Verilog, right? It's very low level, has a little stuff. And so what's the difference? Well, Highfertil has more abstractions. And actually when it comes to expressing this and defining it, Highfertil is simply a superset of low fertile. So of all the rules about the types of nodes available in the IR and what kind of fields they can have, low fertile is just a subset of those, right? So it's saying that, you know what? Some of these node types aren't allowed. And even the node types that are allowed, we're gonna have additional constraints on what are valid entries for some of those fields on those nodes, right? So for example, in high fertile, much like in chisel, you can have some bit widths unspecified, right? You can do things like, uh, you know, define some things and you can go ahead and try to infer the bit width, right? So initially that chisel front end, those bit widths are not known. But then some by term transformation inside fertile as part of that lowering process, those bit widths are gonna be determined, right? And when they can't be determined, of course, we, as you're familiar with, the tools will complain. Um, that's part of the lowering process, doing things like specifying bit widths, right? So you can kind of imagine what this looks like, right? So in high fertile, things like bit widths are unspecified, 
you have things like when statements. And then when you get down to low fertile, uh, all your bits are figured out, uh, you know, and um, all of the crazy things about bundles and subfields are kind of flattened out to just single namespace, you know, and it's uh, easy to kind of have a single sing uh, signals. And, you know, things like whens are turned into muxes, right? So all that kind of figuring out how to turn a when is the right combination of muxes with default values, and that kind of stuff. That's all done by these lowering passes, making it from high fertile to low fertile, right? And so these kind of passes or transformations kind of do these, you know, small little changes. And they, the type of things, they kind of do a little simple thing at a time, right? So they're taking these small steps, like I said, they're really easy to kind of test and develop. And not just about lowering from high level, high fertile to low fertile, right? They can do things... Like maybe you want to analyze your design, right? Since you have the ability to look at your design and kind of crawl around this graph, you can go ahead and, you know, crawl around a graph and learn things about your design. Uh, maybe you want to optimize your design. Maybe you want to go in and crawl and recognize certain things and change that. Uh, or maybe you want to add things into your design, right? You want to instrument it with certain extra stuff. Or maybe you want to specialize your design. Maybe you know that your design is going to target an FPGA this time or it's like another time. There's something you want to do to make sure it most probably matches that target technology, right? And so... You can also do things with these transformations, right? And so it's pretty cool. Um, so let's talk about some examples that are already in the fertile libraries, kind of give a sense of feel for what the kind of things they can do. So, for example, these lowering paths, which are going from high fertile to low fertile, like I said, they're kind of taking all these higher abstractions and figuring out how to make them more concrete, right? So things like inferring bit widths we just talked about, or even something simpler, like just padding the width. So in Chisel, you know, you can have some signal and you can add it to maybe a literal, and uh, perhaps initially, maybe that literal. If it decides to be the minimum number of bits in the horror dot value, perhaps it's narrower than the thing it's being added to, right? And although, you know, that's totally legal chisel, uh, by the time, you know, we get far down the tool flow, we'd re really wish those had the same width, so it's kind of easy for everybody to kind of be sure what we're getting. And so, to kind of make sure that happens, we're going to go ahead and pad that signal out to make sure it does that. So that's, that's the pad width transformation. Um, there's transformations that go in there to go expand the winds. Like I said, you know, if you have a when statement, you know, perhaps a default assignment to a wire, and how does that get turned into muxes? That's done by a transformation, right? Um, and it turns out that a lot of the things we kind of think of, you know, as the safety checks or, you know, robustness checks being done by Chisel, they're actually being done inside that fertile library, which is kind of has hands on this fertile label to kind of play with it, rather than in the Chisel front end, right? Um, that's kind of been the trend long term. It's kind of been adding more and more smarts to this uh, fertile library, more and more passes. It's kind of a very skillful way to kind of add this um, capability rather than making the front end complicated, the front end, if anything, getting simpler. And just adding more and more passive transformations uh, to the fertile library. Um, to kind of go a little more ambitious and actually not just uh, you know lower design, but actually optimize design. Uh, here's some example optimization. These are the kind of things you might also find in the compiler, and that's no coincidence, right? This is kind of you know taking a compiler like for hardware, right? And so something like constant propagation, where you know you want to uh, recognize that hey, a literal is being plugged in here; it's not changing. And say, hey, because this is constant. Uh, perhaps I can simplify some logic or, or operations, right? You know, you know, pulling this in here, maybe this is an anding with the signal, but the signal is known to be one, then perhaps I can, you know, uh, optimize that and in one way, right? Um, dead code elimination, right? Maybe you've experienced this in your projects, right? Where you're trying to um, uh, make sure you don't, uh, sorry, you, you want to put some stuff in your design, you didn't bother connecting to an IO, and all of a sudden it's gone. That's the tool is recognizing, well, it just has no visible impact through IO or some side effects like printing or something, there's no way you can tell it's there, so I'm going to go ahead and save you the effort of doing that, right? And so let's go ahead and remove these, these connected things. Um, additionally, uh, something like, you know, common sub-expression elimination, right? Recognizing that even though you wrote the code multiple times, it's effectively the same operation, you know, this thing plus this other thing or this thing times this other thing. And you can go ahead and, you know, factor that logic, recognize a common, you know, thing and just use it once, right? So these are examples of some optimizations there are. Um, it's kind of that sense, and yeah, they are a little bit compiler-like at times, right? Um, and it's cool. This, these are all very scalable things to kind of build with this kind of uh, exposure to this, you know, externalized hardware IR. Um, so one of the questions that was asked when I was giving this lecture in person was, or not in person, but, uh, you know, live, was, you know, well, how do these uh, instances of these uh, optimization transformations compare to their, you know, uh, similar siblings, uh, you know, in a software compiler? And the answer, like I said, they actually are quite similar, right? So... You know, constant propagation, decolimation, common subspecial elimination, these are like really important bread and butter compiler optimizations you'd have in a software compiler, right? Um, interestingly, it's worth remembering how Fertile fits into the bigger picture, right? So Fertile, this library is still kind of like the middle, right? There's your front end produces a Fertile, Fertile's working on stuff, and the output of Fertile is, depending on what you're doing, maybe going to another tool, 
right? Perhaps you're generating very long and passing stops to a conventional CAD tool. Conventional CAD tools, of course, have you know decades of experience with doing these kinds of things, right? Um, yes, they prune away dead code. Uh, yes, they can recognize common logic expressions, especially with logicization, logic synthesis, and do that optimization really well. And so, uh, not looking at that really well, that tool downstream also has got information about the physical technology you're targeting, right? So it's not just a matter of recognizing that you can have fewer logic gates, maybe understanding the various relative costs of logic gates and be able to more accurately assess trade-offs. And so with that in mind, you may be wondering why bother doing some of these things inside Fertile rather than just leaving it all to the better tool. Uh, the answer is we'll do both, right? We'll do a little bit of that in Fertile and we'll do the rest of it in these other tools, right? Their tools will have more information about the physical things you're targeting and it can really suss out those like more difficult to discern trade-offs but there's some no-brainers, right? That's what Fertile can handle, right? Where it's like, you know, hey, this thing is definitely connected. You should just prune it now, not even bother emitting the bare log. Their tools don't even need to bother, you know, even parsing that and dealing with that, right? Um, or this is definitely a common sub-expression, right? Don't even wait for our tool to recognize this. Uh, just do it for it now, right? It's like definitely a benefit, right? So these are kind of for all things that are like definitely a benefit. There's no question it's beneficial. You can imagine more advanced logic optimizations, especially that are, you know, technology aware. Maybe the right answer is really depends on the technology, in which case it's hard to do without that tech info. Um, as I said, the kind of point of this lecture is to kind of give you a sense for what's possible with this and kind of what's available. Um, so continuing on that thread, I kind of want to highlight a few projects that are working with Fertile. So one of them, if you've come to our, uh, you know, uh, hardware uh, symposium, uh, we talked about open source stuff. We had Firesome come last spring. You heard this great talk from Sagar. We described this Firesome tool. So what it does is it takes your chisel design and it simulates it on a cloud FPGA, right? So so far in this course, we've had tiny designs running for, you know, maybe a few dozen cycles. Instead, imagine you have a gigantic design, you want to run it for millions or billions of cycles. Uh, you'll find very quickly that software simulation really struggles to deal with that. And so having hardware acceleration with an FPGA really helps, right? And using the FPGA is nice. You can take, you know, the chisel, you can spit out Verilog and put that Verilog on FPGA. You might need to write a little bit of harnessing to get on there. But that's still actually not quite what you want necessarily, right? Because if you're simulating something, um, you kind of care about correctly uh, modeling and, be, and mimicking certain behaviors, right? So, for example, maybe your design on a PGA runs at 100 megahertz, except for perhaps the design you're trying to simulate is you know, supposed to be an ASIC you want to run at 2 gigahertz. Maybe run simulation 20 times slower than sound totally crazy, but what about things like how does your design interact with memory? The memory attached to PGA may not be running exactly 20 times slower, or some other things. And so, what FireSim does, using some underhood technology of things like called Midas, actually kind of semi-virtualizes simulation. So rather than simply having every exact thing in your um, chisel design being an exact thing in the um, uh, FPGA design, it goes in and modifies it a little bit. Uh, it instruments and modifies design to kind of track when events should happen uh, and to kind of propagate things like tokens to see, okay, well, this event should happen now, this should have happened at another time, right? And so you can imagine this would be... Um, really hard to write if you wrote this tool from scratch. Oh my gosh, so if someone just gives me random um, Verilog or random chisel, I need to do all this. But they didn't have to do that, right? Instead, the people could focus on what made uh, this worth doing, right? And so what they're going to do is they are going to, uh, you know, take a design as fertile, let fertile do the processing to get design already kind of in good shape, modify the fertile appropriately to kind of inject the things they want to inject, you know, these various tokens and event tracking and triggering and the ability to kind of pause and play various portions of design, do all that by modifying the fertile, and then spit it out and pass it off to the rest of the tool chain, right? So it's kind of they're injecting their you know, novelty right there, right? A similar project is part of the same overarching goal with something called Golden Gate, where they um, went ahead and uh, really analyzed these designs and found that you know there's times when you can reuse things or share things. Uh, for example, you're having the same thing in FPGA actually present multiple things in the virtual simulation and just time multiplex them, you know, do version A now and the version B in a second, and just make sure you kind of tag all of your data, you can get really good error efficiencies that way. And so these are really nice, neat optimizations that were kind of even conceivable, especially in this case by, you know, small grad student teams because of the flexibility enabled by having this exposed hardware IR, you can kind of get access to design, any changes you want to make, and then as long as it still stays in the same IR format, pass it back to the tool flow and the tool flow did the rest of the work, right? This is pretty cool. Um, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't also uh, discuss uh, the research of my own uh, group. <laughs> and so what do we do? We made this tool called Essent, which is a um, simulator for Fertile. So given a Fertile design, it uh, technically makes a simulator, it's simulator generous. It actually makes a simulator for that Fertile design. 
Uh, it's actually the fastest software cycle accurate RTL simulator out there. So it's really fast, right? Um, so what do we do? Well, we don't just take fertile just as an input form because it's convenient. We actually are leveraging a lot of the library to kind of handle a lot of stuff for us, right? So as a result, we're able to focus on this research on our novel uh, ideas how to improve simulation efficiency. And so we spent all of our time on that and we're able to kind of reuse all of this other stuff from the fertile library. So as a result, if you look at the async code, it's approximately 5,000 lines of Scala. You know, there's a lot of hand-waving there. That's not kind of the fertile library we're using, right? The fertile library, I've lost track, but you know, maybe it's over 10,000 lines, maybe 20,000 lines of fertile Scala by now. Um, but so there's some amount of smarts there. But what's cool is uh, for us doing this project, right, if you compare it to something like Verilator, which is, you know, the standard open source uh, Verilog simulator, Verilator is over 100,000 lines with plus, right? And it's over 100,000 lines with plus. And yet um, the optimizations that they support are less sophisticated, right? They have less sophisticated simulation approaches than we have in Essent. And as a result, Essence faster. So Essence two times faster and way less code. And this isn't just a, you know, a Scala versus a Swift Plus kind of argument. This is also kind of looking at the ability of having kind of this nice encapsulated IR where we as Essence developers are able to go in and only write 5,000 lines and able to leverage all of um, the fertile library. Uh, Verilator has not, you know, exposed an IR as easy for people to kind of inject things and make their own tools with, right? And so there are even some of the groups that are interested in working with Essent, not because they actually care about simulation as their goal, but just because it gives them a gateway to um, access Fertile and then do transformations of their own. And so this is pretty cool, right? So with Fertile kind of opens this whole world that we're able to kind of go out and make uh, our own hardware design tools in, you know, it's really kind of a la carte, right? You can use a lot of stuff that's already there and go ahead and inject the parts you want to do and make the parts unique to your project or your design. And so here with Essent or Firestone we just talked about, these are things that are very much like full-fledged tools. Um, we can imagine, for example, on a large design project, you might make some simpler fertile transformations, which are just things specific to that uh, particular project. You know, maybe you want to make sure you insert scan chains uh, the right way for, um, you know, your, your design for taping it out or something. Maybe you want to insert some other things for BIST or something. And these are kind of things where you can imagine putting that into your design and the generators might make it really complicated, but instead kind of crawling design with your fertile transforms later on after it's already instantiated might make it much more tractable. So hopefully I've convinced you that these hardware IRs, especially having them ex externalized and exposed and, you know, formalized, um, is a really cool capability, right? It really makes life pretty neat. Um, and so today's mostly been about Fertile, and that's the one, you know, supporting Chisel. But I want to take a moment to recognize the fact that there's quite a few um, IRs out there. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, uh, Yosis is a widely used, you know, open source tool. And so it's uh, IR's card, R-T-L-I-L, you know, it's intermediate layer. Um, from Stanford, they have the core IR, you know, it's their IR that's available. From ETH, they have the LLHD. Um, and recently, but perhaps, you know, may soon be dominant, uh, is Circuit uh, being made um, by none other than the LLVM folks, including Chris Latner, right? So that's hopefully going to maybe be a really uh, nice standard thing. Uh, initially, at least for now, Circuit has some, you know, ambition to be quite compatible with Fertile. Uh, and so that's, you know, good news for us who are using Fertile. But who knows, maybe, you know, five, 10 years, we'll all be running Circuit or something else. Um, these are just the ones here. Uh, you know, for example, uh, it's on, on this page, right? For example, even here at Santa Cruz, um, you know, the work of my colleagues group and Jose Renau's group, they have LNAST, where they have their language neutral AST is another kind of similar effort. I had to put on this list because it wasn't, you know, as easily standardized and exposed, but it's definitely the ambition, right? Um, so you can see there's a lot of things out there, and so it's kind of great. It's not just that people want to build their own hardware design tools, but kind of the whole point of this whole class has been thinking about hardware design is rather than just producing a single fixed static IP. It's more about, you know, taking this agile approach, figuring out how can you use automation and generation of smarts to, you know, uh, computer smarts to make something that's more flexible and, you know, working in more levels of the stack, right? So. With our generations approaches, we've been talking about how we can, you know, make more flexible, reusable components. And today we've been talking about how we use high hardware IRs, not just if you're a tool developer, but even if you're make, going gung-ho on your project, you can now uh, inject some smarts into the tool flow to handle certain custom things. Uh, and with that, uh, let's wrap it up. Thanks.